What is up, folks? We are here at Burns & Sawyer Rental House with David Hover from Schneider Optics, and we are checking out the brand new Iscorama combined with the new Doolens Cine lenses. Because I have the Iviscope, so I was going to compare the two with yeah, the, uh, do you know about the Iviscope? You yeah. know that? Yeah, yeah. yeah.
So what I'm most curious about is how did the collaboration between Schneider and Doolins come into fruition? It's kind of interesting. I mean, the, the Isca Rema 54 was actually designed back in the 60s and originally it was sold by itself. The idea to come up with a kit was done in Germany and we had a price point that we wanted to kind of be a little bit more digestible to owner operators, things like that. We make lenses. However, they would have been, it would have been a lot more expensive. In Germany, they, they got in contact with Dulens and started a conversation and came up with this set of three so you had a ready-to-go kit. These actually have our amber coating on them. They call it an A-plus coating. So it has a nice, beautiful amber. And that's actually exclusive to the Schneider versions of these lenses. So that's kind of it. it they're nice little mini primes. They've got the A-plus coating that match really well with the Iskorama, and they all fit in a handy dandy little case. So you're kind of ready to go as soon as you, you get them. The most impressive thing is literally the size and weight. It's so rad. Yeah. It's like, wow. Like yeah. you see the video, I've seen plenty of videos of these and photos, but when you, when you hold them in real life, you really are like, wow. Cause each one is well under a pound. Yeah. It's yeah, gotta be, yeah. Yeah. About that. And it's, but they feel substantial. That's kind of one of the thing I was a little worried about, but the mechanics and everything are, are pretty nice. Yeah, very smooth, buttery smooth. I do want to talk a little bit about how you said that um, Schneider made a little accessory to lock in the infinity focus on these. To yeah, use with the it's pretty key because I've been demoing them since uh, this last NAB. And uh, one of the things that always seems to happen is this is an infinity focus system. So you're meant to place the lens at infinity leave it and then you focus on the iscorama well naturally your hand goes to the barrel of the lens to pull focus so you'd set it to infinity and then somebody would go to check it out and they would immediately detune it so there's these little holes like you're saying what we've got coming is a lock system so it screws into the threaded hole and then there's a thumb screw that applies a break so you'd set it to infinity apply the break and then now you don't have to worry about it. And then and if you go to it, you're gonna be like, oh wait, no, that's not it. You focus there. Yeah, if anybody's moving the camera, it'll stay locked. You don't have to worry about it. I'd say nine times out of 10, when I'd set it up at a demo, that's the first thing that would happen is they would, you know, defocus the whole sure, thing. Sure, yeah, it's so simple. That's why like on a lot of DIY setups, we tend to gaff tape it down, you know, so it doesn't move. I did that at a couple of shows and I was like, you know, more out of like, ooh, and yeah. I just gaff taped it and, you know, it kind of looked a little funky, but, you know, that's how I would have done it on set. But thank goodness, uh, you know, Schneider Kreuznach actually listened to us. He, I know you've said that name better than I ever will, by the way. <laughs> that's um, funny. But yeah, they, they saw the issue, uh, made that focus lock, and I think that's going to be a world of difference for that. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that's a great little accessory, especially because these lenses are so tiny and close to the camera. But let's talk about the ISCO, like the Rebirths. And this is, it's important to point out that this is a single focusing system. So you don't have to double focus, nothing gnarly yeah. like that. That's a big deal. Yeah, and it has a really nice big focus throw too. That's something I noticed just in the testing. But I wanted to talk about, you said the first iterations, I guess was the rental version, mm -hmm. didn't have the amber coating. It did not. It had uh, the V plus coating, which is actually the dew lens coating. That's their so signature. that's their standard coating. Gotcha. Uh, it's, it's a pretty coating. It does some fun things, but we were, using these lenses to pair with a classic lens. So the amber coating gave it that warmth that you're kind of looking for in a classic setup. And, you know, I, I think it's beautiful. I mean, it, it just really adds to the whole package. For sure, yeah, the rainbow is just, yeah, it's... it's yeah, and a, a nice little amber yeah, kind of edging, which is really pretty. Definitely unique look. Anamorphic lenses, you know, everything's subjective in this world, right? Like, as far as optics go. A lot, you know, some of the people are really into like, oh, anamorphic streak. Oh, the, you know, it does this thing. And it's like, well, that's not exactly what they were meant to do in the beginning. Right. That's, oh, I hate to say it, but it's kind of a mistake. You know, it's not exactly, good job, lens designer. You, that wasn't the thing. Right. So you'll get a lot of people that if they're looking for an anamorphic lens, they really want just clean anamorphic. Mm -hmm. um, what this provides is the option to kind of fine-tune your anamorphic experience to the story or whatever with clean anamorphic and then you could apply streak filters I've been using net filters and really kind of tuning the look um, yeah. streak filters come in different strengths so 
let's say you do want a streak filter and you want it to go all the way across the frame, you just apply a heavier streak filter. If you want just kind of a wisp, you can do that too, which I think that just gives you so much control over the entire picture. So that's the difference between like a two strength, like, like they make them in different densities. Mm -hmm. So you're saying the lower density of true streak won't streak across the whole frame? Yeah, you've got a one millimeter, two millimeter, three millimeter, and four millimeter. Got it. And so what you've got is if you want that streak going all the way across the frame, you can just use a stronger streak strength. Gotcha. If you want just kind of a nice little, the, the car's Sliver. coming down the street and you want that little wisp on both headlights, you can do that. The lower density. Yeah, and then of course there's colors. So that's yeah. that's the thing too, is a lot of people will look at anamorphic lenses and say, oh, this has a really neat uh, indigo or mm -hmm. really green or blue. Well, you kind of have to live with that because that's the coating. Right. With uh, colored streaks, you can go in and introduce a blue or actually there's a color called indigo that I think is gorgeous. It's yeah, just like a I've little bit one. richer, you know? Yeah. Um, and then you can control the strengths. Yeah, so. I love that. That's another good thing to point out. The actual ISCO doesn't have color coding, right? The amber is on the dew lens. Is that right? The amber is on the dew lens. It's not on the... It's this not one. on the, this here. Right. So that's... This has coating that's going to control like the flare and things uh -huh. so it doesn't get all gauzy on you. Right. Yeah. But no actual color coding. No. no yeah. And that's really cool because that, again, like you said, opens you up for options to use either the different colored streak filters mm -hmm. or all kinds of wild various lenses. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, it, it really does things like takes a an interesting lens and gives you the opportunity to make it anamorphic, anamorphic. and carry those characters forward. Yeah. I love that. What size is this filter thread here? So this Doing... is actually a 77. Okay. Oh, so cool. So this is a 77. We provide these step rings because the dew lenses are 72. Okay. This is a 77, so you'll notice those are 77 to 72 step rings. Gotcha. The 77 just opens the door for many lens yeah, options, which so is great. Much. Um, we also are, as accessories, are selling 77 to like 58, all of your yeah. common ones. Yeah. And then there's actually another one that's coming, which um, I found to be really important, a 77 to 77 gap because a lot of the modern lenses, obviously the front element is all the way to Moving. the front. Oh. And that's pretty deep, right? So yeah. if you're just to go straight in, you're gonna hit. So that gap ring, you can put them on a lot of still photo lenses. Like Awesome. Yeah, I absolutely love it. So maybe we should talk a little bit about any advancements versus things that they kept with the original 70s version. There's not a lot of differences. Uh -huh. The additions are gonna be the, the focusing gear, which was not there. In fact, if you look at a 54, it's kind of fun. In this area here, it's just more of like a kind of a detailed ring like with, that happens to have little slots in it, but that was more of an aesthetic. Okay. So they took that out and it looks like they put the gears in that spot, which is pretty cool. Oh. Um, the original 54, instead of a thumb screw, there was actually a button that released like a detent lock. So you actually clicked it through. Oh, interesting. And then when you got it to the spot, you let go and it locked with like a detent. Mm. Um, Otherwise, the original was a 77 rear. Everything else about it is pretty similar. It was um, this It was this large? It was that large, yeah. Really? It looks much smaller in the photos, like yeah. the original one. The original yeah. one looks smaller than this, but I've never seen one in real life. Yeah, so it really is like a rebirth of the of the 70s version. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what it is. They, they, they kept pretty true to the design with j just some modernization with the focusing gear and the thumb screw you know it just kind of makes it easier yeah totally easy and without the clicks you can really dial it in like make it exactly yeah right. that's that was a thing that i i don't own the original i got to mess with somebody else's and i was always wondering like what if like you're just Need it in halfway. between like it seemed like that might be a little bit tricky exactly that's exactly what i was thinking first thing originally the isco rama 54 wasn't sold as a set with lenses it was something that you bought and you would add on to lenses that you had or, or existing in your kit. Um, for me, it's become like, oh man, I gotta go to the lens closet and be like, oh, I haven't used these in forever. And you just gotta pull out like old Nikkor lenses, right. or, you know, Leica R's with the Cinemod where you've got the 77 front goes right on there. Yeah. There's somebody that has an 80 millimeter to 77 millimeter clamp on adapter. So like super speed. Yeah. So that's, that's where it becomes you know, it's just your imagination is the limit, right? Yeah. So you could find something like, oh, I love the look of this. I'm shooting an anamorphic project or whatever. And then you can just adapt it. Yeah. Um, of course, a lot of those, you're going to definitely want to use the lens support. 
Um, right. Yeah, and there's yeah. actually some more accessories coming for that. The lens support on this one is just a quarter 20, mm -hmm. but one of the accessories, they're gonna have a beefier foot. Okay. So that's coming soon. So that, because this is a single, yeah. you know, you kind of want to have oh, something right. a little beefier. For maybe. sure. Obviously this is meant for anamorphic alignment, but when I was at NAB, we discovered that people love the fact that you can rotate the element mid-shot. Yeah. And it has this really interesting kind of a warbling effect, which was not by design, but you know, things happen. Like you get a lot of creatives looking at stuff and then next thing you know, every time I was showing it, they're like, hey, can you loosen the thing and do the... Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, PS Technics booth at Burns and Sawyer was manning and uh, I noticed it was out of alignment and I was like, oh, hold on one second. And I pulled it and everybody's like, whoa, do that again. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> yeah. And you know, yeah. it, music videos, I love that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, there was definitely a lot of that kind of play, sure. not by design, but it happens to have that capability. So <clears throat> just back out the thumb screw and then just take out the lens support and foot. Spins. And then you could literally just take, you know, any of those sort of zip gears, put put that on there oh, and then just motorize it. Yeah. Yeah. I got you now. So I keep threatening to do that. So you so. could go in and out even. During yeah, you the could, shot. or you could just have it just spinning. Yeah. You know, so. Wow, and that's wild. It won't, it won't pull all the way off when you do well, that. Well, that. that was the funny thing is that was a question that I asked. I'm like, so this is looking to be like a popular feature and they said, no, it's not gonna go anywhere. It's just, awesome. it's just an alignment feature that kind of just keeps going, so. Wow, that's um, cool. Because I noticed on the, on the Iviscope, I believe if you go too far, it literally comes apart. Yeah, that's what I was worried about because we were doing that so many times. I was just like, I don't know yeah. what's gonna happen, but they said it's, uh, I, you know, there's, Somebody smarter than I yeah, designed this, so sure. apparently it, it won't. But because of the original design, I'm sure you noticed the front end does turn. Yeah, right. So, yeah, everyone's kind of already mentioned that. Yeah, and that's that's one of those things where a lot of people are like, "Hey, how come you didn't, you know, design it not to?" Well, they were really staying true to the original design, mm. which sometimes those things come along with staying true to the original design. So, yeah. what I've been doing is. Um, rod mounted map boxes and like maybe a donut yeah, in there donut just sort of suck sure. it up so it's it's a thing and we're aware of it um yeah. it didn't really bother me I, I don't really like to use clamp on map boxes but that's just yeah. my own thing so like i'm used yeah. to using donuts and stuff which is the ideal so yeah. that that's the way so i would, I would, I would imagine it. like keep less weight off of this thing you know even though it yeah. is really really beefy still it's like you know, yeah i guess this is beefy but i guess it depends on what about, you got yeah, back exactly. here and so. then you start throwing filters in the map box or you know yeah, so that, that's kind of a thing. And then also, because that travels, I definitely suggest like a double wide gear mm. because it could walk off. You know, if you don't have it on oh. one end, it could travel off of there if you're really doing like a big rack. Sure. I, don't, I don't think you had an issue today with that. No, not, not the yeah. little manual follow focus. No. But like I'll use a... I'll use like a double wide and it just uh, travels along on there and I've never had it walk Just to off. help it out, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's that's kind of it. I definitely find that I get a lot of uh, people that have been shooting for a long time going, oh my gosh, this is the piece that I learned anamorphic shooting on. Oh, wow. Um, that's really neat. And then the younger you know, content creators and things like that, they're like, wow, it. this thing is so cool. It just spans so many decades of uh, anamorphic shooting. And right now, anamorphic is super hot. Like everybody's sure. into it and everybody's like, which set should I get? Mm -hmm. um, for me, this is like the ultimate Legos. Yeah. You know, you just... What lens do I want to use? I have lenses. Do I want to do a Nikon? Sure. You know, it, it's yeah. it really you can kind of get crazy with that. Yeah. The will it be sold separately, or do you have to buy it with the do lens? You have to buy it with the do lens. That's the thing. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think that's going to be like that for a while. Yeah. Um, we get that question all the time. Uh -huh. um, I think what the decision is just the kit, make the kit. That way, people have a grab and go solution. You yeah. Kind of. I mean, it's a solid kit either way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, the, sh the do lenses shoot nice on their own. So yeah. now you've kind of got best of both worlds. You can go out and have a really nice compact package with the sphericals. Um, and then you can, or you switch it to it's like anamorphic mode and yeah. go that way. So it kind of becomes like a six lens kit if you think about it. You can get PL mounts for this. We're going to have that as a sold separately accessory. So they are user changeable. This is the PL version, right? So you'll notice you don't see exposed screws. Oh, here's the one one thing. A lot of people have noticed 
it looks like there's a missing screw. Yeah. That's that's not a missing screw, that's just kind of a blank. So it's just five screws. But yeah, so this comes off, and then pull that off, and then you'll put the mm. cannon on. So ultimately, you could have a set of EF and PLs, and then just kind of swap them back and forth. If you need yeah. To. You know, I know a lot of people just want to peel out of the gate, but I mean, like in your situation with a Komodo, I think it's way easier yeah. with the EF. Yeah. Um, but you'll, you'd have the opportunity to switch them. It's always awesome for Future Proof to know that if you, when you're ready to go that route, that, yeah. that's available for you. Yeah, it's not like you have to buy the lenses again, exactly. you just get a set of PLs. Yeah. Yeah, 95 millimeter front thread. Uh, you know, it's a pretty pretty big filter, but it's, it's available. Besides uh, rail mounted, I've done some clamp on Bright Tangerine plus one, Polo plus yeah, one. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, so now the only tricky part is it's a smaller system, so if you're like one man band, you kind of have to adjust it and then lock it down. Mm -hmm. You're sort of limited on focus at that point, yeah. so that's where the rail system is. They also make the, what I have from Bright Tangerine is the one tray with the little wheel on it, and you can just yeah. spin it. Yeah. That, that would be really ideal for something like this too, for one man band. Sure, It'd yeah. It'd be like a, basically a variable ND kind of situation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well thank you so much for hooking yeah. up the rental house for us to come in and play with the lenses and thank you so much for uh, setting it all up for us today. yeah no worries i'm excited that uh you're excited and uh, burns and sawyer was great to do them last minute just kind of let us have the spot so yeah so rad yeah so rad thank this you so great. much pleasure man awesome yeah. okay folks i certainly can't leave you without sharing my two cents giving my feedback I only used this set for two days, but I'm really glad that we went back out the second day and I hit David up to just go outside and just mess around with it because that is kind of how I use uh, my camera. You know, I run around, just me and a few other guys, and that's kind of what I do. And using the Iskorama set like that, it really put it into perspective of what it would be like using that set uh, for, you know, one-man band or you know, smaller kind of um, projects. Right away, I do want to start out by saying that I love the Iskarama. I really do. I've never used the original one, but man, this one is a beautiful big hunk of glass and it is rad, man. And I'm so glad that I brought the Iviscope with me to Burns and Sawyer. I mean, that Iskarama has such low minimal distortion. It is just, it's really nice. And you really get to see how good it's controlling that distortion when you stack it up next to the Iviscope. And I have the fourth gen Iviscope and man, now the issues I have with this with the set is mainly I have three major issues with the Doolin's lenses, okay? And I know that, you know, I am just one ignorant opinion up uh, amongst many, so keep that in mind. But also I want to drive home to you all that I have slight OCD. So when I see a flaw or something that I perceive as a flaw, I hone in on it bad. And that's, so, so I just wanna say these things now because when I start talking about this and I get going in my groove, I, I'm a very passionate guy, especially if you're new here, you might, I might like, whoa, throw you back a little bit. So the first thing I'm gonna say, the first negative about the Doolins right out the bat is the set that I was using was not color matched. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys already saw it in the, you know, the rental house test footage. You know, the 85 millimeter I'm talking about in particular. The 85 millimeter, I questioned if that lens even had the A plus amber coating on it. <laughs> okay, because it was completely different color temperature. And and I purposely did not try to color match those, those lens tests at, at when we were at Burns and Sawyer. But however, I did dial it back in for the, the little bit of river footage that I used for B-roll throughout the Talking Head, the interview session there, because, you know, I wanted to kind of show some more like documentary style footage. I know it's not the greatest, but, you know, it is what it is. It's what we got on the day, blazing hot sun. Uh, let me just bring you into Resolve because I want to show you what it was before I you know, color corrected it. And you'll see what I'm talking about. So you see all these nice warm clips these were with the 43 millimeter Doolens and the ISCO. See where it turned where all these are like super blue? That's, those were all shot with the 85 millimeter Doolens. Nothing changed, same exact camera settings, same exact ND filters. All that changed was I took the 43 mil off and put on the 85 mil. Now that is crazy. That is a huge difference in color temperature. I mean, just look at it. Look, look how warm the 43 was on this clip I'm hovering over. 
And look at the blue. I mean, the, the, the 85 mil looks like something out of a Terminator Salvation. The second issue that I have with the Doolins is Doolins knew they were making these lenses to be paired with the Iscorama. So my question for them would be, why does the Infinity Mark not have a hard stop on it? Guys, the dual lens lenses go beyond the infinity mark and it's by a good distance. And you know, the dampening on the focus ring of those dual lenses, it, it's it's not a lot of dampening. It's, it's very easy to move the focus. And that's what we talked about in the interview with David. And you know, luckily Schneider saw that problem. So they made this focus lock accessory. That's great and all, but now that they're making that, I would strongly urge and hope that Schneider is going to include that accessory in the kit because honestly, that day out by the river, just the running around that I was doing, it was constantly getting knocked out of infinity. And, and there was even a couple of times I yelled at Dave, like, is it still on the infinity mark? And so I would just really hope that Schneider is going to include that focus lock accessory in the kit because I wouldn't even want to use the Doolins in that scenario again. It was really hard to maintain the infinity focus and that's crucial for when using front anamorphic adapters. I think here, if I had to go out on a limb, I would think the reasoning behind Doolins doing that is because maybe they thought, hey, maybe this would help people not have to worry about using shims you know, because they probably know these lenses are gonna be used on a wide array of different uh, lens mount adapters and different cameras with different flange distances. And so maybe that was the reasoning they wanna give people more wiggle room rather than using shims. I guess, maybe, I don't know. That's all I could come up with. My third issue with the Doolin's lenses is the weird rainbow flare. Now on the day, it seemed cool, but after sitting in here in the edit and looking at that footage over and over again, it dawned on me like, oh my gosh, this is going to be on every project shot with these lenses. And I have seen spherical review footage of the dual lens lenses without the Iskorama in front of it. And that's just a signature look of the dual lens lenses. This weird, in my opinion, non-organic rainbow, I call it a flower petal flare, certainly on the wider focal lengths when it's paired, when that 43 mil is paired with the Isco, it looks like a flower petal. That may be cool for one, maybe two projects, but I don't think I would ever use it again because it's such a, it's just, it, it's it's one look, right? And, and, and it's not really a clean slate. And I honestly think that a lot of clients, directors, producers, they're not gonna be hip to that look all the time either. And yeah, I know you say, well, that's the beauty of the Iskorama. But here's the downside, guys. Schneider is basically forcing us to buy those dual lens lenses because that's the only way we can get the Iskorama. Right, so that's kind of another disappointing thing. I mean, you could you could almost see the disappointment come over my eyes when I asked David that question in the interview about how he said, yeah, he, he, Schneider's probably gonna keep it this way. Now, I think, I, I know, like at first that seems like a really bizarre choice for Schneider to do, but when you start thinking about it, it actually makes a lot of sense because Schneider is not known as a lens manufacturing company. They're known as a filtration company. Right, so they're a filter company first. So maybe they thought, well, we don't wanna be making a mass amount of these Iskoramas. Let's just team up, make a little kit. And if people really want this thing, they're gonna to have to take these dual lens lenses with it. Right? If you ask me, well, what lenses would you use? I really wanted to show you guys the Leica R's and my Minolta Records behind the Isco, but I couldn't because I didn't have a lens adapter with me and Schneider does not include one in the kit. They knew enough to know that it's a big beefy lens. I mean, I don't even call the Iskorama an adapter. I mean, it, it straight up is a cine lens on its own. Guys, it is twice the size of the Iviscope, okay? The Iviscope weighs the same as a Sigma Art 18 to 35. Now, I am not saying that the Iskorama weighs twice what a Sigma Art weighs. I'm just saying, it is way larger than the Iviscope. It is like the size of a small cereal bowl. I mean, it is big, right? It basically is its own cine lens on its own. So there was no way I was gonna put that thing on the front of my Leica R. And I didn't have a lens adapter with me because I'm used to using the Iviscope. Iviscope, you know, ships all of their, uh, the, the Mark IV versions ships it with a lens adapter. You know, it's a bummer I didn't have it with me and it's a bummer that Schneider doesn't include it in the kit. The other thing that I realized by going out and doing the kind of the real world LA River stuff was I finally got to see the real downsides of that front rotating element. So as we talked about in the interview, the front element of the ISCO spins a full 360 degrees. I didn't think it would be such a big of a problem because I just thought, well, I have the rubber donut. But once I got out there, I was quickly reminded that the, that the bright tangerine black hole rubber donut, it suctions onto the lens. Well, it's so taut that the ISCO could not spin. So 
What I did as a quick compromise, I loosened the clamp on the actual Misfit map box. So as you can see here in this BTS footage, the black hole rubber donut just spins within the map box. Um, so, you know, that was a compromise I made, but not everybody is gonna have options like that. So it's gonna be quite difficult for those of you that need ND filters on the front of your lens. There are some little drawbacks, but I can, I'm okay with those drawbacks of the Isco Rama, right? I'm fine with that because I love the Isco Rama that much. What I'm not okay with is is being forced to buy the Doolens lenses with the Isco Rama. Thanks for watching. I want to give a shout out and special thanks to Ellen Woomer for being our model on the day. I want to give a shout out to Miguel for, you know, being my videographer, capturing the interview, capturing all the BTS and B-roll when we were there at Burns and Sawyer. I want to thank Burns and Sawyer for allowing us to use their rental house as a little ghetto makeshift testing studio. Uh, obviously, I want to give a shout out to Dave, man. He's an awesome guy, really cool guy. And I want to thank Schneider. I'm still a fan of Schneider, man. Um, with that being said, I have to give a shout out to the members of my Dog Times Patreon, specifically my Patreon producers tier, Mike Skinner, Fred Parr, and we have a new member of the producers tier, David Carroll. And of course, my one YouTube Pro Tips member, that's Visit VR. Thanks, guys, and we'll see you in the next one. Let's see.